Tell us a little more about Stuxnet and the ramifications of that attack. Yeah, so Stuxnet was really a first of its kind. I mean, every day we're seeing like small evolutions in the uh, cyber world of, of attackers constantly um, improving their creations. But Stuxnet wasn't just some um, you know slight evolution. Stuxnet was practically a, a revolution. Um, you know, before Stuxnet, we were primarily focused. The biggest attacks that we saw, the things that worried us the most, was primarily cyber espionage. Um, and at that time, mostly, frankly, coming from China on private companies uh, in the US, trying to steal things like their intellectual property, their secret paint formula, that kind of thing. Right? The vast majority of what we were seeing is really attacks on consumers, trying to steal people's 16-digit credit card numbers. And Stuxnet fundamentally changed uh, our, our jobs. It became uh, the first piece of cyber sabotage, something that really broke out of the digital world and caused physical impact. Um, and it's something that we've never seen before. Um, you know, we're talking about blowing things up literally in the real world and potentially killing people. For those who don't know what was Stuxnet, basically it was a malicious attack or a malicious threat that got into Iran's um, nuclear centrifuge facility in Natanz. And its goal was basically to destroy those centrifuges. Once it got in there, what it was able to do was basically spin up the centrifuges at a rate faster than they normally should run at, um, cause the aluminum tubes to hit what's called a resonance frequency, begin vibrating uncontrollably, and, and literally explode and, and shatter, um, potentially causing a sort of a domino effect uh, across the room. And you can imagine uranium gas you know, leaking out uh, inside of this facility. And so you can imagine, here I am, we're sitting in the office and we're trying to protect people's 16-digit credit card numbers, and suddenly we're coming across something that has huge uh, geopolitical uh, effects. Wow. Okay, well, so this is a whole, this is new territory. Um, are there laws or treaties or regulations that are sort of starting to govern that, or is it like the wild, wild west? That's yeah, interesting. There's huge parallels with the nuclear side, right? We're here really focused on the nuclear side and how there's this existential threat. And now, quite frankly, you know, we see cyber <laughs> offensive warfare in a, in a very similar uh, light. Um, it's not um, sort of just hypothetical Hollywood writing to say that today you could take a cyber attack and shut down a country. This is possible. Um, tell, tell them about what you were talking about when we spoke in Santa Fe about yeah, uh, I mean, Belarus, was it? Yeah, so in the Ukraine, actually. So, you know, we used to, even in the film, if you, ever, if you see this film, I'm, on, I'm, I'm speaking on the film and I talk about how Stuxnet really ushered in a new era, where you have this era of real world effects, this era of potential cyber warfare now, and that, you know, you could do stuff maybe like shut down a power grid, maybe interrupt, you know, water waste treatment, maybe cause airplanes that fall from the sky. And I talk about that in a hypothetical in the film. And since that film was shot, it has now happened. In the Ukraine, the power was shut down via a cyber attack believed to originate out of Russia. Um, 260,000 customers in the western Ukraine lost power for about six hours. Um, and basically, the attackers just got in and sort of flipped the virtual switch. And what's interesting is they got the power back up in six hours, which is actually quite good, uh, you know, I think. Um, it, I think it would probably take much longer in the U.S. They had something that was to their advantage in the Ukraine. Even though their power grid was controlled by computer systems, they still had quite a bit of sort of old school power grid, you know, physical technology. And they basically just disconnected their computer system from the grid and then literally just began flipping the grid back on. <laughs> and you can imagine in the U.S. that's probably going to be much, much more difficult. And if something very similar happened in the U.S., um, you know, the repercussions could be quite greater. And again, it's, it's not a theoretical anymore. The technical feasibility to do this has been shown. It is possible. Now, it's much more about motivation and no longer about the technical hurdles. So, do you know if there's anything going on in terms of in Washington to develop sort of rules and laws and treaties and getting people to s stop this? Yeah. Or behave, at least, I should say. You know, in, in the nuclear side, you know, not only do we have a variety of treaties, uh, but there are also some sense of norms. Um, and any kind of sort of warfare, there's some sense of norms. And in the cyber world, there are no norms. Uh, there are no treaties. Uh, there is no understanding between two countries that 
you know, we're going to only go up to this point. Uh, maybe with one exception, actually. Uh, interestingly enough, just last year, uh, President Obama signed a memo of, under memo of uh, understanding with the premier in China and uh, basically got China to agree to stop uh, hacking private companies in the U.S. You know, still hacking the government, things like that is still <laughs> fair game. Uh, but hacking private companies for their intellectual property was now off the table. And, you know, when that was signed, everyone sort of balked, like, China's really going to stop doing this. Um, and in reality, from what we've been able to see, they actually have stopped. Um, and we saw a huge decline in the number of attacks on private U.S. companies going after their intellectual property. Um, they're still hitting all kinds of other countries, um, doing the same thing, but it did decline in the U.S. So, just back to the question, there are no norms. Um, and, you know, if, if you are um, maybe a bit of a conspiracy theorist, you would claim that the U.S. probably doesn't have the motivation to have norms. Uh, the U.S. was probably one of the most advanced in cyber offensive technology. And obviously, if you look at things like Stuxnet, it probably wasn't to their advantage to have some sort of norms in this space. But times have changed now. Stuxnet did open up Pandora's box. Um, what's interesting about Stuxnet was that it actually spread all over the world. Okay? It didn't just hit Matanz and Iran. If it had, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. We would have never found it, right? I work for a private company called Symantec. We provide security solutions for private companies all over the world, but we don't do business in Iran, we don't do business in Syria, and these types of places. Stuxnet was designed to spread anywhere and everywhere, in fact, any Windows machine, anywhere in the world. And if you happen to have a centrifuge connected to your Windows PC, it would have you know, tried to attack that. And it was only because of that that we found it. And once that happened, it did usher in a new era. Before Stuxnet, we were tracking maybe four or five uh, campaigns or attacks that we thought were nation state related, originated from nation state. And now we, we tra easily tracking, you know, over a hundred. Um, and it's, you know, it's obviously become mainstream, you know, news. I mean, we saw that with the election as an example. Yeah, so, okay, so lastly, is there anything we can do to protect our computers or to, pro I mean, are there things that the average person can do or the average company can do? I mean, I put a sticker on the little camera on my <laughs> laptop, but... There's really sort of two parts to this, this question. You know, what can the average person do, and then what do we need to do as, you know, maybe as a country or as the world? You know, what's interesting about ushering in cyber warfare is that it, it brings in a whole new dynamic. Um, when you talk about classic kinetic warfare, and if one country launches a missile at the U.S., it's the responsibility of the U.S. government to basically prevent that missile from hitting the U.S. Okay, and taking out our country. If you talk about some nation state launching a cyber warfare attack against our critical infrastructure, hitting our power, hitting our finance industry, you know, shutting down the internet, um, none of that is controlled and operated or defended against by the government. Your power company is a private company. The people protecting the power company from cyber threats are private companies like Symantec. And so it now puts us in a very different position, trying to protect critical infrastructure, not only for the US, but you know, business in Germany and France and the UK, uh, et cetera. I mean, just imagine if, for example, the US went to war with the UK, you know, what, what would that mean uh, from a cyber defensive point of view? Um, so, you know, it's just a whole different dynamic now uh, in, in that space. So what can those companies do to protect themselves? To be quite honest, you know, we're doing our best, but we are private companies trying to protect private organizations against nation states whose budgets you know, far exceed any, anything that you can imagine. And so that in itself is quite a challenge. For the personal person at home, uh, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. You know, if someone comes to you and just tells you, oh, just install this, you know, even if I, you know, we sell consumer software, if I told you, just install Norton, it's our consumer product. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a single thing that you can do, unfortunately. You know, if there's one single thing you can do, to be honest, it's about being aware and staying educated. You know, any advice that you get today on how to protect yourself may not work in a week. Uh, the attackers are constantly evolving and defenses have to constantly evolve. Um, if I could throw out some really cheap things that I would do right now, okay, it's not one thing. The first thing I would say is use what's called 2FA or 2-factor authentication. You might log into your Gmail account, for example, your email, they prompt you, hey, give us your phone number and we can add added security. Yes, you're giving away your phone number, which maybe if they get hacked, your phone number could get leaked. 
but the cost benefit is probably there. What they do with two-factor authentication is every time you log in with your password, they send a special code via SMS text back to your phone and you have to type that in. So even if your password gets lost, no one can get into your email. All right? And if you don't think your email is important, John Podesta didn't think his email was important. <laughs> if John Podesta was using 2FA, none of that would have ever happened. It's a very small solution for potentially very big impact. I think we've all learned that email is really important. Um, great, thank you so much, Eric. Thank We're gonna have a chance to ask more questions later.